The vastness of this land is hard to fathom. And embedded in its earth is an iron spine. 160,000 miles of ringing railroad. And as deep and dark as the mist-veiled forests and pitted canyons can be, deeper still are the mysteries and secrets along this great expanse. And there's no better way to explore this visage than by the haunting light of a westbound train. From cursed death cars in Cleveland, Ohio, to diamond-eyed drifters <laughs> and E.T. altercations out west. Join us as we grab a seat in the observation car, order up a cocktail, and peer out into the darkness at the things lurking along the ride. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury, in. close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogma and Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians are demons. Specters and spirit spooks. summonings. Paralysis. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. It. That's old. Y two K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi there. Hello. Welcome to be here. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And we are the Brothers of the Belief Hole. And today, we're going to take you on a ride. Ooh, that had notes of Art Bell. <laughs> Want to go for a ride? <laughs> yes, but we are going on a ride. We're taking... What I like to call, and Jeremy does not like this, the paranormal rail pass. Yeah, it's a little cheesy. It's a little cheesy. But until someone has a better name, I'm going to use There's that. no edge to that. Paranormal rail pass. What is the concept, though, Chris? Break it down for people. Well, Jeremy and I are on a trip, and John is stuck at home right now. So we wanted John to come with us. So we thought we'd take him and you on a journey across the country out west on the Bleafle Express. <laughs> well, okay. This gets cornier and cornier. But yeah, I thought this would be a cool concept to take a trip across the country since we're doing that already and maybe take some fascinating and strange tales from each stop that we've taken along the way on the Amtrak. Yeah. Sounds cool. I like how you did that. You integrated your life with the yeah, show. Exactly. That's very cool. That's a cool concept. I feel like, yeah, even though I said it was cheesy, the title is, but the concept is interesting. Par how about Paranormal Passport? Ooh, that's better. I think those are both kind of... There's, you can't have something by, you need like Nightmare Train or something with like some edge to it, you know? I, but I like the idea. It reminds me of, um, remember the Night Gallery? That was Rod Sterling. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. After Trod Zone, I think. This is rather a special place with a special statuary and special paintings. And they carry with them a coldness that seems to go best in a crypt or in a place like this called the Night Gallery. That concept, but like moving. I feel like there's probably some paranormal show in history where the concept was like you're on a bus and each stop is a destination. Paranormal Breakdown, that was our idea for a show a long time ago. Remember that, guys? Yeah. It's still going to happen. Should we up an RV to fail every uh, <laughs> every 20 miles? And then wherever we land, that's where we get stories. Yeah. Go to local bar. It have to be called Paranormal Engineered Breakdown. Okay, I guess we could uh, just not put <laughs> gas in. No, we run out in whatever town it is. We collect stories from the local inhabitants. The local pub. We have to start in like New Mexico or West Virginia. Oh, where we're sure to die of thirst. <laughs> the desert. <laughs> well, just a place where there's a lot of lore and weird oh, stuff. Yeah. I mean, if we went out to like... That's everywhere. Uh, there's definitely some parts of the country that are more mysterious and magical than others. Yeah, but I think any anytime you get out of the city, you're going to run into some local lore. But you're That's right, there, there are places that definitely feel like they have a magic. And case in point, we are in one of those places now. And we're going to get there by the end of this train trip. Right, Chris? <laughs> yeah. This strange railway that we're on. But yes, what strange visages, Jeremy, are we going to encounter on this railway to the bazaar? What dark crags are we going to be careening through in the late hours? 
Well, I'll just say, hold your co-passenger tight and guard mm. that neck pillow fiercely <laughs> because you're going to need some protection. There's some crazy things coming up. We're going to get off the train stop by stop at every location that we stopped at going from Cleveland uh, to the hellish departure time of 3 a.m., which Ugh. is apparently the only time you can leave on the Amtrak at Cleveland because a demon runs the uh, schedule. Apparently. Leaving from Cleveland, going out all the way to, well, now we're in Utah. Hatch. Hatch, Utah, which of course the, the train does not go here, but we took a train to Colorado. So each stop along the way, we're going to stop and we are going to maybe pick up some listeners, tell some listener stories, and also tell some local creepy tales and lore. We have entities coming through the wall in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Ooh, uh, tent camping abductions in Estes Park. Ooh, my favorite place. Many strange occurrences and unexplainable phenomena throughout the trek, finally winding us up in Utah, where we will view strange lights in the sky, cloaked technology, perhaps. A real account in Hatch, Utah, where we actually are at the moment. That's right. Uh, not recorded by us, but oddly, posted several days before we arrived here. So that's going to be fascinating, along with a creature. Yeah. Perhaps a Bigfoot? And most likely we won't get to the end of our travels in the main episode and the expansion members can join us for the late night ride. Yeah, but the main episode is going to have a cornucopia of bizarre accounts along the railway. So you guys, I think you're in for a treat. I think you'll find the strangeness will be delivered stop by stop. And so hop on board as we take you to each strange and unsettling stop. Blow that whistle, John. Boop, boop. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be dropping that in. All right, well, you guys ready to begin? Yeah, start us off in Cleveland. What is so mysterious about Cleveland? Cleveland. Well, yes, where we embarked from. The city of torso murders and burning rivers. Oh. Some of you are familiar with that? That strikes a familiar chord. Yes, this metropolis that is our home state, lakeside city. There's some famous haunted stuff that we won't be covering, but I wanted to mention them because they are significant and I think sets the mood. From mysterious child deaths at Franklin Castle to the enormous mm. and ominous haunted house of wills funeral home i don't know if you guys have heard of that but they do a seance every year wills funeral home yeah no it's a pretty creepy place they kept it from being condemned and destroyed but kept it sort of in a decayed state mm -hmm. and now they run tours um ghost hunts and seances out of there it'd be kind of fun is to that do. where you can see the ghost of drew carey uh he's still alive but yes he's from cleveland so i get your joke well no the, the show right wasn't that his show was in cleveland, cleveland, rocks, cleveland rocks. yeah He's also from Cleveland. Drew Carey show. I was like, what is the name of yeah. that? But he's alive. Okay. Hey, anyway, moving along. <laughs> <laughs> Not get stuck on Drew Carey here. Okay. So, but I wanted to dig into one specific story here in Cleveland before we leave to our next stop on the strange railway. We were headed down. And this is the fascinating, creepy case of the Midwest Railway Preservation Society and the death car. I'm going to guess you guys have not heard of that either. The death car? Nope. Okay, well, buckle up. This is pretty creepy. Pretty tragic, too. By the way, warning, and what's the term for this? If you are sensitive to death and sometimes murder uh, <laughs> details. Sensitive to death. Murder. <laughs> sensitive to death, but not murder. Yeah, because we don't do a lot of true crime stuff in this, but there is murder and uh, death and some tragedy on this episode, so be warned. Okay, so the Midwest Preservation Society does a pretty cool thing. They rebuild train cars and preserve them. And they'll also repair yours if you happen to own a, a train car of sorts. They'll repair it for you. Oh, that's good. So man. if we ever have a real belief hole express, we can take it there. <laughs> I'm sure um, we'll use that in the future. So the B&O Roundhouse was built between 1905 and 1910. It was a central service center for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which might sound familiar if you play Monopoly B&O Railroad. It employed hundreds of people in its heyday. Our story takes place at the B&O Roundhouse because that is where the death car is stored. Creepy. And to tell this tale, I'm going to use a fantastic resource. This is a, a pretty great book that we had here. Haunted Cleveland from the Haunted America series. And this was written by Beth Richards and Chuck L. Gov. But let's begin this tale. The Lackawanna passenger car was in a horrific accident at 5.23 p.m. on August 30th, 1943 in upstate New York. The collision was between a passenger train and a freight train. The engineer of the freight at the controls was going 80 miles per hour, trying to make up time, when he saw another locomotive holding on to the track in front of him. There was no way to stop, 
and a collision was inevitable. As they collided, some of the cars derailed, but the death car slid and split the boiler of the freight engine's locomotive, blowing out the windows of the passenger car and sending steam and water into the car itself. 26 passengers were killed immediately, and two other passengers died later of their injuries. According to the official report, another 114 people were injured, six of them from Cleveland. Now, the folks who work or have worked on this car truly believe some spirits have stuck around. For example, when the workers were repainting the death car, the windows kept slamming shut, even if they were propped open. The volunteers also heard whispering and made claims that they always felt like someone was watching them. Charlie Sedgley, one of the volunteers, feels that there are at least 15 different spirits keeping an eye on things. Charlie has often wondered why the spirits don't bother them more. And one time, he asked them. He received a whispered word. Fixie. That's it. Charlie feels that the spirits must approve of the work that they are doing here. Steve Corpus, a trustee, has led many tours through the death car, and on several occasions, he has been asked by visitors whether the man standing behind him in the funny suit has any stories to tell. Steve knew before turning around that he was the only person, the only solid person, standing there. Guests have also reported seeing a man who fit this description sitting on the roof of the car with his feet dangling over the side. And one of the best stories Charlie tells is about the ghost who got away. This is kind of interesting. The crew at the Midwest Railway Preservation Society was refurbishing a car for an outside party. And every time anyone worked on the car, he or she would hear a rapping noise on the outside of the car. The workers were constantly running outside to see who was out there or if someone was playing a joke. But no, they were always alone. This went on until the car left the roundhouse and was delivered to the gentleman who owned it. The minute the car left, so did the wrapper. None of the workers gave it much thought until they got a letter from the man. The message was something like this, quote, What is wrong with this car? I will be inside the car and something starts rapping on the outside wall or the roof. Every time I run outside to see what's causing the commotion, it stops. I thought maybe it was kids playing a prank, but there is never anyone out there. I imagine that would be very creepy. I mean, if you are going to make some ghosts happen, the best way to do it is probably to melt people with uh, boiling steam. Oh, that's so, so crazy, so sad, so disturbing, terrifying. Yeah, if you want to create a haunted train car, you would do it by filling it with boiling steam when people are inside. Yeah, until they are ghosts. Yeah. When did that happen? 1940s? Okay. Rest in peace, people. It's been a while, but yeah. Too soon? Too soon? <laughs> I did like uh, the fact that one, one guy got away. He just like on that train, got on the other train car. Which is weird if you think about it, because trains come in and out. You know, you leave and depart on trains, so maybe he thought, well, I can just hop on this one. It's going out. Oh, that's what he did? Yeah. He leapt from one to the other? Well, like I a, don't... The guy brought his car in to be repaired. Like a Tom Cruise moment? And then when it left, it had a knocking upon it. Good old Tom Cruise. Oh, wait, like <laughs> the ghost switched? Yeah. I thought you meant that the guy, like, before it hit the boiler, one guy jumped to another train that was departing. No, 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 no. Oh, because that would have been pretty amazing. That would be amazing. Yeah. Maybe one did. But that's not in the story. Super creepy. So this train is not active anymore, so the people who are encountering these spirits, they're, what, restoring it? They're restoring it, yeah. Kind of like the St. Helena and Canal Fulton, where you just keep painting it. Exactly. The ghosts of Canal Captain's Past. But this place is open to the public. They do uh, sponsor paranormal investigations at night. So maybe we should go on up there. It's not far from where we are. It would be interesting to revisit. We've talked before about the, um, I think that was it the, the beheadings or the torso killings, torso murders, the train track yeah. killer. That's a whole other topic that I, we, I think if we ever do true crime, which I know we tend to just avoid because it's pretty dark, but, uh, that is an interesting one. And it's an old, old story, mm-hmm. but an interesting murder mystery case that we could dive into sometime since it's local. Yeah. That would be interesting to do. Obviously there's plenty of things to talk about in each location, but we wanted to hit multiple stops on this adventure of strangeness. Oh yeah, the rail pass gets you all the way across to the west, yeah. and that's where we're headed. Utah, here we come. So next stop, you guys ready? Yep. Johnny, you so excited? I'm pumped. Yes, all right. Chicago, the windy city. We've arrived. Oh yes. 
Now, there's no shortage of strangeness in the Windy City, as many of you know out there. Classic, you know, very famous things like H.H. H. Holmes, the murder castle. Oh, the murder house. Sorry yeah. with that. John, I know you know that one, right? H.H. H. Holmes, the uh, mur- he built that torture mansion. I mean, I may have seen it, but it doesn't ring a bell. So he created a uh, murder, what they call a murder castle. He basically built this place in 1893 during the World's Fair, and he designed this place, this home, really. He built it out to have secret passages where he could basically murder women and hide them. Was it just women? I thought it was men and women. Either way, very disturbing, heinous, heinous stuff. We won't be going deep into that today. Uh, Plenty of people have done deep dives on that. You've also got Resurrection Mary, which might sound familiar as well. Classic, famous, ghostly gal who hitchhikes all in white in Chicago. It's always in white. Near the Resurrection Cemetery, hence her name. And she always vanishes, leaving a chill in her wake. Classic. (laughs) Uh, And of course, one thing we've never covered because, you know, so many people have covered it, but the pretty incredible Mothman flap in 2017 in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Great documentaries about that. We're going to skip over all that and get to, I think, a lesser known tale that's pretty fascinating about a woman who gets her murderer convicted from the grave after she dies. Oh, but before we do, a couple interesting facts. Mikey Finn was a bartender. Lone Star Saloon and Palm Garden Restaurant known for slipping poison into his customers' drinks in order to rob them. And by 1918, many more service staff members in the city adopted his plan and began to do the very mean thing of using poison to steal from bad tippers. Uh, Sadly, three people died, but the reason I bring this up is because I think it's an interesting trivia fact that this is where we get the term slipping a mickey. Really? Really. So he was mad at bad tippers, so he poisoned them. Yes. And then would he take a, a tip? himself hey rob him okay that's the point i see justice yeah. a lot of robbers in <laughs> justice the, is served in the 1918s <laughs> i'm not a fan of bad tippers but that's a bit harsh yeah i'd say pretty severe well i don't think the intention was necessarily to kill them right away just to poison them enough to make them sick i guess and then steal their money yeah because only three people died otherwise all these people who were poisoning people were very bad at it anyway another interesting fact from chicago before we get into our main chicago tale i'd never heard of this before but the very first televised exorcism took place in chicago in the 1970s Really? I wasn't really aware that there were, were there many televised exorcisms? I guess maybe on like WGN or yeah, those channels. Yeah, religious channels and such. This was actually aired on NBC in April 1971. The exorcism was. NBC. The, the one and only Peacock. <laughs> but that was an interesting account. And actually they're going to be making a uh, film about it starring Starlight from The Boys. Remember that character? Oh yeah. From the Amazon show? Yeah, anyways, well that's a different conversation. But it's interesting Basically, it was this couple, Ed and Marsha Becker, and they bought a flat, a two-flat home in Chicago in 1970. Soon after they moved in, paranormal activity, of course, flickering lights, plates flying out of the kitchen cabinets. Typical. People getting kicked. Anyway, so as this stuff starts happening, you know, they don't want to believe it, but the husband, Ed, starts rooting around in the basement and finds some sinister secrets about the house's former occupants. So eventually they come to realize that there is actually some evilness going on, some dastardly goings-ons, and uh, they eventually have an exorcism, and it is televised, and there is a Paranormal Witness episode about it. We'll have that linked as well as a documentary and the book you can read. Uh, uh, well, I guess, is that a spoiler if you tell us if the exorcism was successful? Or? I don't want to spoil it. Okay. So it'll be in the notes. Those are long tease. I'm good at those. Yeah. Tantric Chris, we call him. Oh, boy. For our main story. This is an interesting story and a little bit of true crime, actually, because there is a court case involved. This is an interesting case. This sounds fascinating, actually. Yeah, this is, um, I call a voice from the grave convicts a killer. And some of you may be familiar with this account, but I bet many of you are not. And this is also in Chicago, right? Yes. Our second stop. Teresita Basa was born in Dumaguet City in Philippines in 1929. After graduating from Assumption College in Manila, she moved to the U.S. in the mid-1960s. She worked as a respiratory therapist at the Edgewater Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. She was regarded as a respectful woman that was extremely committed to her profession. She lived an average life and lived by herself in an apartment. On February 21, 1977, firefighters responded to a call on the 15th floor, which was Teresita's apartment. Firefighters were able to put out the fire quickly, but when they entered the premises, they stumbled upon a horrific sight. A burnt mattress was on the top of the lifeless body of Teresita. When they turned the mattress over, 
they found her naked with a butcher's knife buried deep in her chest. Oh, God. Investigators believe that the fire was meant to cover up the murder. Thankfully, an autopsy concluded that she hadn't been sexually assaulted. No one had a clue as to who could have committed such a horrific act. Teresita had no known enemies and was generally seen as a reserved and kind person. With no fingerprints to match due to the fire and no clear motive behind the murder, the case went cold. Okay, so this is where the story wanders into the realm of high strangeness. So five months after the murder of Teresita, the lead detective, Joseph Statula, received a strange call. A Dr. Chua said to the detectives that his wife, Remy, who was a respiratory technician at that same hospital, Edgewater, had information about the case. Uh, Initially, Dr. Chua was hesitant to talk to the detectives, but he proceeds to tell them that his wife, for the past few months, would occasionally become possessed by the spirit of Teresita. And this is how it all began. It all started when Remy was in the nurse's lounge taking a nap. When she woke up, as clear as day, she saw Teresita standing in front of her. Terrified, she quickly ran out of the room. A few weeks after that incident, Dr. Chua was at home and his wife was in their bedroom fast asleep when suddenly he heard his wife scream. Dr. Chua ran to their room and saw Remy sleep talking, but she sounded a bit off and had gone into a trance-like state. The voice told him that she was Teresita Bassa and she needed his help. Dr. Chua asked what she wanted and she told him that a man had entered her apartment and killed her. She pleaded to him to tell the police. Remy suddenly woke up and had no recollection of what happened. Pretty crazy. So at this point, they're pretty terrified of what's going on. They're also confused. They're not sure exactly if they should believe what's happening to be a reality. Right. And they also, even if they did, they have no evidence, new evidence to give the detectives. So they don't move forward with this at this time. So weeks go by and Remy goes into another trance. And this time there's a revelation. It was the voice of Teresita again, confronting Dr. Chua, asking why he hadn't gone to the police. He told her he had no proof to back up her claim, but this time Teresita named her killer. She said it was Alan Showery. Showery worked as an orderly at the same hospital Teresita and Remy worked at. In the trance, Teresita revealed that Showery came to her apartment to help her fix her television set. She said that shortly after arriving, Showery choked her from behind, (laughs) stabbed her with a knife, and attempted to burn her body. He even stole some of her jewelry before leaving the scene of the crime. She even went as far as telling him that Showery gave her jewelry to his girlfriend. At this point, Dr. Chua and Remy were convinced enough to present the information to the authorities. The detectives were skeptical, but decided to pay a visit to the Showery's unannounced. Showery told detectives that he was in fact there at Teresita's apartment that night to help her with her television set, but didn't have the right tools. So he told Teresita that he would be back some other time and headed home. But while Showery was being investigated by Detective Stachula, Detective Eplin was with Showery's girlfriend at their home being questioned as well. Detective Eplin asked if Showery had given her any jewelry lately. The answer was yes. Showery's girlfriend agreed to come to the station and bring the jewelry. The family of Teresita were able to point out all of the items that belonged to her. A pearl cocktail ring that was being worn by Alan Showery's girlfriend that day and a jade pendant inside a jewelry box. Confronted with the evidence, Showery suddenly made a full confession. He said he did go to Teresita Boss's apartment that night to help her fix her television set but didn't have any tools, so he told Teresita he would be back with his toolbox. Broke and desperate for money, he formulated a plan to rob and murder Teresita. Alan returned to the apartment, and Teresita let him in. When she had turned her back to lock the door, that's when he placed a chokehold on her, dragged her body to the living room, and killed her. To confuse investigators, he had stripped Teresita of her clothes, He then placed the mattress over her and set it on fire. Dark. For his crime, Alan Showery was sentenced to 14 years for the murder of Teresita Bassa. 
After only serving five years, he was released. <laughs> That's insane. Crazy. Whether or not you believe the claims that Mrs. Remy Chua was possessed by Teresita Bassa, the clues she had given to the authorities led to the arrest and conviction of her killer. To this day, the murder and the mystery surrounding Teresita's case is arguably one of the most bizarre murder cases in Chicago's history. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. So he was released after five years. Yeah. What's that's, the, that's, why? There's <laughs> more to the story, obviously. If you want to go down a, a long rabbit hole, was there doubt of his guilt? Yeah, there were some questions about the process of this, you know, as you might guess. A lot of people, and well, actually I'll link a uh, newspaper article about it as well that was in the 1970s where they're actually discussing the trial. But there were allegations that the Chu has actually testified as witness to the defense because they believe the story would discredit the case. So that was one of the allegations that they told the story in hopes that, which doesn't make sense yeah. because the investigation only started because of their description. Yeah. The argument was obviously like no one had at this time, at least according to the defense's attorney, had been charged based on the testimony of a dead woman. Right. A possession. A possession. Yeah. Is it possible? I mean, the skeptical argument could be that Mrs. Chua, who was allegedly possessed by Teresita Bassa, potentially maybe she knew who the killer was or she was somehow involved and enacted this possession to implicate Alan Showery and set him up for it. I mean, well, it's interesting because there, I guess there was an initial trial in 79 where uh, it was a mistrial because of a hung jury. Mm -hmm. And a, a month later, while awaiting a new trial and against the advice of his lawyers, Alan Showery actually pleaded guilty to the charge of murder. Oh, really? So he got 14 years. Is that a plea? Is that, I mean, is that why? Yeah. Lesser sentence? Yeah, released after five years. The other, another thing was that he was released in 1983 after only serving four years. But I always thought it was weird. Like if it, let's say it was just totally made up, you yeah. know, and the, the, there was police corruption involved and they just wanted to put somebody away from the murder. Evidence on him. Yeah, I guess that, girlfriend. that's the one thing that's interesting that, you know, the nurse said he stole the jewelry. And then they go investigate, talk to the girlfriend. She's wearing the jewelry. They take her down to the station. The pearl the, cocktail ring. And the family identifies that jewelry. So at least it seems to be the case. At least Shallery stole that jewelry from her apartment. Yeah. Is it a coincidence that she was murdered that evening? Right. Uh, but who knows? Or did Mrs. Chua give that ring to Alan, who then gave it to his girlfriend or some? You know what I mean? And then she yeah, I mean, set him up. A whole number of yeah. explanations. But it's but. A definitely an interesting story. I mean, it's certainly possible. I think plausible with everything that we, obviously we cover on the show. The idea of a spirit that remains after death, you know, with that lingering trauma and need for justice that could take over someone sensitive, mm -hmm. you know, to state their case. I mean, it's definitely possible, I think. It might be the first case of that being used in court uh, as a, a, you know, a dead woman testifying, possessing someone who then gives evidence to police. But I don't think that's the first time you've had accounts. And I'm pretty sure in the Appalachia, there was a famous story of a woman who pointed out her killer after death through similar Kind well, of, of course, don't drop that even in, but... indirectly, you have mediums and psychics who famously have been contacted by right. the spirit of someone who passed and, you know, it helps solve a murder. Yeah. So that, I mean, if you believe those, some of those cases, which I think some of those are pretty hard to refute. Yeah. And I want to do a deep dive on that. Yeah. Psychic detectives. Yeah. Does happen. Yeah. Some are definitely pretty hard to refute. Yeah. Either way, tragic for this woman and this family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was in 1970s. Rest in peace, Teresita. Yeah. Well, moving on. Hopefully our next stories coming up aren't as sad. I feel like my first couple were pretty, pretty tragic. Let's get into some other strange accounts. We're ready to hop back on that platform. <laughs> All aboard. The further we get out west, the more I think we are susceptible to entity visitation from the stars. If you will. Right. Potential abduction phenomena. Oh, crazy Something stuff. Something about the mountains. Crazy stuff happened last night. We'll have to mention at the end. That's true. We did have our own weird experience out here in this crazy Hatch, Hatch Utah ranch. Cattle ranch. Yeah. But on the, uh, I thought this was interesting, on the, um, the subject of trains, there's just something mysterious, I think, and nostalgic about trains, train travel. If you guys have never done it, take a trip. It's uh, awesome. It's a fantastic experience, especially overnight. There's something kind of haunting about being on a train while it's going down the countryside, watching it whip by in the dark. You see the back ends of little towns across the country, the United States yeah. specifically, obviously that's what we have experience with, but it is kind of a mesmerizing and memorable experience. And I was curious because we did do an episode, 4.1 expansion episode, train tracks of terror, railways to elsewhere. That's right. And uh, I was curious looking back, because I know we've had, and if you're listening, Mr. Conductor, we had our train engineer, we had a train engineer contact us or a conductor at some point, and I can't find that comment or email because I wanted to include whatever it was. But in looking, I found this comment from Phoenix Bon Lenzen, an expansion member, 
And they said, when they were growing up, they remembered in the southern Alberta area, they'd heard a story about a passenger train that went through the Rocky Mountains that ended up derailing into a lake. Yikes. And they weren't sure if it was true, but it creeped them out because apparently they could never find the train. Apparently, the area where it crashed was so extremely deep, the water there, due to being in some mountain cavern or crevice that it had sunk into, that it could never be found. Now, that's the story. It's crazy. They weren't sure if it was their stepdad that told them about the story. Apparently, he had some really interesting stories. We'll put the full link to that comment in the show notes, but it got me interested in that idea of what, I wonder if tra- there have been trains that have just disappeared a- into the deep, you know, falling off trestles and the like. I don't want to hear about that on the way home. Well, we're going to hear about it. Got that big trestle. This is how you prepare, Chris, for in case it happens to you. But I just found these stories kind of fascinating. These are somewhat historical mysteries, some recently solved. But there was a train, a locomotive. The uh, Canadian Pacific Railway locomotive number 694 had apparently disappeared. It disappeared in 1910 and was only recently found in 2016, I believe, 106 years later. Wow. Buried under 235 feet of water in Northern Lake Superior. How does that happen? Do they just not know where it goes off the trestle? Well, I'm going to tell you okay. how it happened. So this, guys, uh, link in the show notes to this photo or watch on YouTube. So I'll have these images in the YouTube video. Hopefully this wasn't a passenger car. No, only three men were aboard, but still tragic for these three men and their family. And these three men were from uh, Schreiber or Schreiber, Ontario. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. They died on June 9th, 1910, when the freight train crashed into a rock slide that had covered the railroad tracks, sending the D-10 steam locomotive, a tender car, and several boxcars into the lake. So you just imagine seeing that on the railway? A rock you slide. You just know that like you're, you're going into the water. Yeah. It's not like you can recover from a land derailment, but you're right. going into, into a lake, a great lake. Yeah. Because I, I was reading when I was doing these stories, I was reading about trains and uh, apparently it can take like a coal train, like two miles to completely stop once they begin to slow down. So you're not going to be stopping by the time you see those rocks. Yeah. You need like a periscope. Well, yeah. And apparently they've kind of pieced together what happened, at least with one of the fellows. So John, if you want to read this, this is an account. During the night and into the morning of June 10th, 1910, the train crossed the Aguasaban River and rounded the sinuous curves of Jackfish Bay, not far east of what is now Nays Provincial Park about six miles northwest of what is now the town of Marathon. The train approached Mink Harbor on Lake Superior. Quote, The main line at that location is right beside the lake, but the lake level is about 65 feet below the level of the track, said Doug Steferak of Schreiber, a retired CPR locomotive engineer. With a rock face to their left and the lake far below to their right, the three man crew of the 694 found themselves bearing down on a rock slide, dead ahead, strewn across the rails. There was no way to avoid the crash. The brakeman, Jay McMillan, apparently jumped from the train in a futile attempt to escape. His body was later found beside the tracks. Quote, the other two guys, the engineer and the fireman, They went over the embankment and into the lake, along with the 694, a tender car, and at least two boxcars, Steferak said. The fireman's body was never recovered. Jeez. Terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you know if this was at nighttime or during the day? Yeah, this was at night. Uh, This was during the night and into the morning of June 10th. So this would have been in the early morning hours of June 10th, 1910. So yeah, there it sits at the bottom of Lake Superior in Mink Harbor. It's still there? Yeah, surrounded by the debris field that I guess was created when the train crashed. And so it had fallen off the 60-foot ledge uh, of the tracks. But yeah, crazy. So it was engineer Frank Wheatley, fireman E. Clark, and brakeman J. McMillan who died during the crash. And the story, it's not really well known outside of the Canadian rail community and the uh, kind of the local area there in Northern Superior coastline. But the locals uh, in Schreiber, or Schreiber, And the descendants of the men lost carry the memory of 694 and engineers and crewmen who live in the community who pass the crash site on a regular basis. They carry the story on to younger generations. Crazy. Yeah. I did find one other account. If any guys out there are in North Carolina and are familiar with Kerr Lake, you may not know that there is also a train buried below one of your favorite fishing, camping, and outdoor lover necking spots. 
Creepy. Of Kerr Lake. So Kerr Lake, apparently, a dam was erected in 1952, the John H. Kerr Dam, which created the lake. But long before that, before there was a lake there at all, it was the Roanoke River with a few smaller tributaries. And on this river, an ill-fated train would need to cross. The year was 1918, and this particular trestle was constructed of wood. There had been a fire on the banks of the Roanoke River, and the trestle had gotten scorched, weakening its stability. But the engineer had yet to be advised of the situation. So when the train hit the trestle as it began to cross the river, it simply fell right through the structure and crashed into the river. Afterwards, it was decided that it was too big and too difficult to move. So it remains exactly where it landed. Over 100 years ago, now mostly forgotten, covered beneath 50 feet of water from Kerr Lake. And we'll have uh, pictures in the show notes, guys, and in the YouTube video, probably showing now if you're watching. Maybe this wasn't the right episode to do. <laughs> we still have a return trip to take on the trail. <laughs> no. At least we'll be prepared. Prepare for what? What are you going to do? <laughs> Jump. Okay. Didn't work out for that guy. Yeah, so in this photo, this will be in the show notes, guys, and then, you know, if you're watching the YouTube video, you can see it. So check us out on YouTube and watch along. But in this picture, you can see a man standing on the right side of the deck, and people believe that he was the engineer who was driving the train at the time. Both he and his brother, who may also be photographed here, were the only people on the train. Reportedly, neither survived the accident. Aww. So there is the train that is now at the bottom of Kerr Lake. At least they went together. Yeah. So if you're there, guys, keep your eyes and ears open for the spirits of the lost. The tragically submerged beneath the waters. I think I hear that whistle. I think it's brake stop. Time for a smoke break? Break time. For all those passengers on board, stretch your legs. But don't miss the horn. That's something we learn on the Amtrak, they say. Yeah, 15 minutes, and sometimes they're... I don't know if they ever do a callback. If you're out too long stretching your legs and the train goes, you're, you're just you're out of luck. Might be stuck in a strange place, so... Yeah. With your luggage still on board? If you, yeah. yeah, if you're getting checked bags, goodbye luggage. That would suck. Yeah. And carry-ons, too, if you didn't walk outside with them, which I didn't take any of. Hey, the train's just in time. Did you guys hear the horn? Oh, there it yeah, is. Yeah, that's my house. Is that your house, Sean? Mm-hmm. Right on the tracks. It's the ghost train. You better lock your doors tonight, Sean. Trains are coming. I always do, Jeremy. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on in the expansion? Ooh, good question. What is going on in the expansion? Well, we're going to continue the journey. Oh, that's right. Of course, we have a second half of this episode after the break. But in the expansion, we're going to get even weirder and stranger. Yes. Tales from the lands along the track. Depending on how far we get down the track in the main episode, we probably will get out to Utah, which is where we are currently in real life. But there are going to be some things that we probably won't have time for. And some things that are stranger and bizarre. Yeah. Creatures seen. Creature sightings for sure. Things in the sky. Yes. Ooh, which we have to talk about what we saw in the sky last night. Yeah, we'll get to that. Also, um, some spooky sorority spirits. Oh my god, that's scary. At uh, Utah <laughs> University, we'll be talking about. Ooh. Pretty interesting. Ghostly pillow fights and the like. Ghostly <laughs> pillow fights. <laughs> Fun. All right, yeah, it's going to be a great expansion episode, guys. So if you're not a member and you'd like to hear the expansion episode, we drop uh, an expansion episode every time we release a main episode. And if you're interested, sign up at Beliefful.com. Click on the big red Join the Expansion button. Sign up and we will see you there. Access granted. It was a cool October night. A young couple was sitting on an empty field behind a local school talking. There was a pleasant cool mist falling. Soon the ground became very muddy. It suddenly became very quiet, and both looked up at the same time, and the hairs on the back of their necks stood up. They looked behind and over their left shoulders and saw about 200 feet away something crawling on its stomach out of the shadow's edge. They stared in horror as they watched the bizarre figure crawl towards them. It was dark in color, no apparent clothes on, and was lying on his belly with its arms down, held close to its waist. It was inching forward with nothing but its feet to push it forward. The joints went back and away. The head of the humanoid looked up and all they could see was two black pools where the eyes should have been. Both witnesses jumped up and ran into the car about 50 feet away. After a few seconds, they started the car and drove off at high speed. 
Later, strange tracks were found in the mud. Thank you. On that train. Riding those rails, we were coming up to my favorite stop, Estes. Well, there's no stop at Estes Park. That's true. <laughs> we had to stop in Denver and get a ride up to Estes, but that is uh, my favorite land in all the world. Estes, Colorado. It is beautiful. Dry, fresh mountain air. But strange things, as we found. Mm-hmm. Strange things there in that dry air. Yes. Most people are familiar with the Stanley Hotel, famous for The Shining. Stephen King. Actually, I love that story. I'm sure we've mentioned it on the show before, but how Stephen King got a room at the Stanley Hotel several decades ago and had a dream of his son being chased down the hallway by a fire hose and oh, yeah. woke up from this nightmare and went out on the legend is anyway that he went out on, on his balcony, had a cigarette, and in that one cigarette had the entire at least outline of the shining really written in his mind. And it was all from that nightmare in the Stanley Hotel. Yeah, most of his books and movies are kind of uh, autobiographical in the sense that they're usually surrounding an author, right. a writer, going through an alcohol issue, <laughs> or struggling, in this yeah. case, trying not to murder his family and then right. succumbing to the demons. Great book, great movie, different, but both good. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, it would be cool to do a Stanley Hotel dive at some point. It was, you know, for those of you who know the movie The Shining, Stanley Kubrick, with all the hidden messages allegedly in that, that'd be a great thing to break down sometime, and the, the moon landing with that. But only the... out exterior was shot for the film the stanley hotel even though that's where he stayed and wrote it but the made for tv movie with the guy from wings was oh, yeah. actually filmed inside the stanley hotel but now they have at the stanley hotel it's supposed to be haunted they have haunted tours they have the shining tour but they also have what do they have in the basement don't they do seances yeah. now i was really and i we shared this in our facebook community a picture of us in front of it and i think people were hoping we were going to stay the night there and we did not i wish we did didn't have a chance to we were hoping to go on the way back but john this is really cool in the basement although I don't know if I would get myself to go, but it looks awesome. So they do, if you go downstairs under the Stanley Hotel, they have one of these bookshelf things that open into the speakeasy. And underneath is like a stage where they do magic shows and seances. And uh, they have this like renowned seance dude. Yeah, I don't know how legit it is. but He looks like the guy from Are You Afraid of the Dark that we always mention, Mr. Pardo. <laughs> kind of, but older. No, Mr. Yeah. Um, anyways. Sardo. He does these seances. It's called 13 is the name of the seance, because I think the ghost is supposed to be the third, kind of like 13 13 guest, right? There's only 12 people allowed in the seance at a time for each of these, whatever Friday nights they do them. So you can get a ticket. It's 150 or 200 bucks a person. And then you'd go to this private seance in the cellar of the Stanley, basically, which would be a picture in the show notes. He definitely looks like a man who would conjure things. (laughs) He does. I think his uh, title, he's like a professional apparitionist. That's right. Which I've never heard that term before. I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, definitely be fun to do if I was, wasn't terrified. Maybe we'll do it sometime. I'm not going to do that. I'm not interested in being attached to any. Well, I'm not like either, that. John. It's not on my list of things. Yeah. I find it hard to believe that you can summon. It is a roll of the dice for sure. Summon for, I mean, the only thing that I can think of, I don't think you can summon spirits at will like that. I mean, who knows? I mean, I think there's legitimacy to certain I mediums don't think and psychics, that the, but an apparitionist sounds more like a conjuring or a trickster or even potentially yeah. I mean, that's like demons. much past the, uh, just the traditional Ouija board. Yeah. Unless it's just a show. Unless it's all like I don't think and, the idea is your con. I, don't, I mean, if you believe in any of that stuff, I mean. If you're just watching a dude though, and like he's conjuring like some visual manifestation using like, say, I don't know, a projector. Obviously, I don't think that's much of a risk. Well, I mean, like, if, if you believe that any of that stuff is real- and he's actively inviting that stuff in. It just depends if you if think it's is, yeah. nonsense. Or, yeah. And his intention. So what you're, what yeah, you, you, Jimmy, you're just saying if he's actually an illusionist and not a medium is what right, you're saying? Then you're essentially watching a movie. Right. Uh, that's not what that's what we're talking about, but I see what you're saying. I mean, if he's made a business off of it, I'm imagining he's at least trying to summon him. He's not trying to just be an illusionist. Well, I think you could argue that a lot of people made a lot of money by faking it, by not really trying to summon anything. But like, At this point, though, with all the social media and stuff out there, I, I get what you're we saying. Should, yeah, you're right. We, we should, I didn't look into what his services are. Like it yeah. could be. Although I'm not, in, you know, either or it's like, if he's an illusionist, that's not interesting. And if he's actually doing it. Well, it'd be know. like a magician, which is the other thing that they do in the basement is a magician mm-hmm. who, you know, he's not, probably not doing magic. 
because <laughs> magic is demons. Uh, he's probably doing tricks. <laughs> Uh, but it's the same. So I kind of, I wasn't sure if it was like a form of a magician where he does like hocus pocus apparitions. Oh, that, if it was like a wink, it's supposed a to wink, be a wink show. thing. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Cause I didn't look into it, but we'll put it in the show notes. So you guys can check it out. But of course we don't recommend consorting with spirits. Yes. It's one of those things where I'm always intrigued by those things. And, I, and part of me always would be curious to go to a medium or something like that. Of course, then there is always the other end of that. Like, I also don't want to, like John said, anything to attach to me. What do you guys think out there? I've seen one too many, um, ghost hunter things where they don't even do a seance but they bring stuff back with them and messes up their family life yeah. but i believe like a 0.1 percent of those no i think there's something to that actually i've seen enough and john i mentioned this to you recently but someone wrote in and i do want to cover this story at some point but he was an author and i think he went around giving lectures or at least book tours about channeling he was really into it and then the last book he wrote was called something about hungry ghosts oh that's right the siren call of hungry ghosts by Joe Fisher. And he believed that whoever he was channeling was basically tricking him and manipulating him and feeding off his energy. Yeah. And then he ultimately ends up dying kind of mysteriously. It was said to be suicide, but some close to him believe that he was pushed by the spirits. Anyways, it'd be an interesting story to tell. Well, the suicide could have been directly linked to the pushing of the spirits, getting inside of his head and making him insane. Well, yeah, that's, that's the assumption. That's what was weird about that is that someone wrote in with that idea. Yeah. And before I told, yeah. before I read you that email that morning, you came downstairs and told me your dream, which was basically what had happened to this person. It was so bizarre. I dreamt that I was watching a movie in a first very small theater with a guy who I didn't know. And the movie was about a author slash kind of paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, whatever you want to call it, who had become obsessed with this particular haunted house in the story that he was researching and writing. And he went to the house and basically went mad, disappeared, and ultimately died. And so he was drawn to his death by these hungry ghosts. And I woke up that morning and Chris told me that we had this write-in after I told him what I dreamt. It was essentially the same plot or very similar. Yeah. So I definitely think we should do it. Shout out to, I forget your name, we'll drop it in, uh, who who sent that in. But um, Cammy, Thank you, Cammy. Yeah, interesting stuff. But anyways, let's get back on the train. Yes. We've got more stories to tell and more stops to make. So make sure you have your luggage securely stowed and your cigarette put out outside the train because there's no smoking aboard uh, unless you are a spirit from the past. So our next stop, I don't know. <laughs> does that good. make sense? No, it does. Now I think about it. It's all off the cuff here. Uh, next stop is Denver, Colorado. We don't have a specific tale there. And any of you listening from Denver, feel free to share some. Send them in. But we're moving right along up to, as we mentioned, Chris's favorite place in Colorado, which is Estes Park. I found a few interesting accounts from my favorite resource, Albert Rosales's Humanoid Encounters. And actually, he grabbed these from uh, New Fork. I found the original cases. New Fork, the uh, North... What does it stand for, Chris? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I'm in my mind right now. Network for UFO... Uh, regional traction. Sounds right. I don't know. I figured what it is. But anyways. National UFO Reporting Center. A great, great outpost for UFO accounts, alien contact, allegedly unexplainable things. In these cases, I found from Rosales, who found them from there. The first case happening August 1981 at 10 p.m. This occurred in Estes Park, Colorado. I was at Camp St. Mallow, summer camp. We were camping out overnight. This was something they did for the kids who stayed two weeks in order for the new kids to check in and old ones to check out. It was an optional trip. After dinner and campfire, we went to the tents. I was restless for some reason. We were all in two-man tents. I remember noticing a very bright light outside the tent. I tried with all my might to wake up my sleeping companion. Bill, wake up. Bill, wake up. His eyes sprang open but they were motionless. I mean, they stared straight out, as in death. I then heard the zipper of my tent open. I had thought at first it was one of the campers with us, but it waved at me, and I felt motionless. I felt no fear. They must have been three and a half to four feet tall. Its skin was almond-colored. It had two large, bug-like eyes and no trace of a nose but I could detect an indentation where its mouth should have been. I heard something in my head, not a voice, but more like an emotion. As if by autopilot, I was motioned outside the tent by hand. I was surrounded by white light. I felt a pinch in my arm, 
and I faintly remember an unfamiliar feeling like I was somehow genetically different than the others and needed special watch. All I could remember after that the next morning was being carried and set down back in my tent. I'm now 31, going on 32, and I've tried to piece this together. I do have a mark on my left arm I cannot explain. I now live in Alaska, and I have a reason to believe I was abducted again in Wasilla area, although I have no memory of it. Most of what I have reported has been deeply buried in dreams and has gradually resurfaced over the years. I did report something to the camp authorities the next day. Although I don't remember what I reported, I do know that I was not the only one who reported something. Hmm. Now this is really interesting because I went on New Fork after finding this in Albert Rosales' collection of humanoid encounters. And more recently in the New Fork database, I found another one from Estes Park, Colorado. Another camping experience. Oh, another one in a tent. Another one in a tent. What did you call that story? Because I thought it was so good and you didn't say it. Oh, I'm sorry. That story I called Alien Intentions. Yeah. Like in tent. Like he's in the tent. Like in a tent. That's good. Thanks, Chris. Go on. Uh, but again, this next corroborative story takes place in Estes Park, Colorado on July 29th, 2023 at 1 a.m. Three of us were camping in a tent. I was woken up by a disc-like light hovering above staring at me. I was on my back and suddenly paralyzed. I was trying to wake up my brother and my boyfriend, but I was not able to move or speak. I was completely sober and scared to death and just waiting for the thing to go away. I don't know how much time went by, but it seemed like an eternity. I don't remember falling asleep, but I woke up the next morning and spoke to my brother and boyfriend about this, and I have never forgotten. Weird. Yeah. So this object, if it was an object, there were lights on it, and it was reported that there was an aura or haze around the object. Kind of like what you talked about with the recent cube reports. Mm. Uh, missing time. A disc-like light hovering, staring at me. Yeah. So this was outside of the tent? I guess it must have been. Or was it inside the tent? That'd be even weirder. Like a small disc of light? Yeah, I'm not sure. Weird. But it was while camping. But yeah, either way, it's strange. When I go camping, I don't normally think, I, I worry about bears, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe a Bigfoot if I heard noises about. Skinwalker if I'm in the Four Corners area. Dogman? Or dogman, of course, anywhere I am. That's what I'm worried about. But I wouldn't normally think to be afraid of something in the sky. You know what I mean? Really? Or something alien-esque that's just not the go-to for well, that was my i mean we were out last night looking at the stars because out here in hatch utah is just you can see like the whole galaxy it seems like but that was the fear that i felt last night was just be especially the stuff that we saw in the sky well, yeah that's probably a good time to mention i guess even though we're not in utah yet on the train but john i don't know if it was starlink we saw two things last night yeah it was really one weird. chris caught on camera and very we were only out there for because we had work to do and we were outside for maybe 10 minutes and saw something kind of crazy and then went inside and later took a break, went outside for another 10 minutes and saw another thing crazy. And we're just like, wish you could stay out here all night and just watch. Because if in those short periods of time you see bizarre things, imagine what you'd see if you just stayed out all night watching. But the first thing we saw was this, you know, you can see, and I'm sure you've seen this before, if you're ever out in a dark area, like the little tiny ball of light way high up, maybe it's a satellite. It's not blinking, but it's just like maybe a little green light and it's moving very quickly across the stars. Or silver light. Or silver, silver. I always see the green ones, but they, they travel really quickly. So I saw a couple of those right away because you're just out. There's so many stars out and so much, so it's so clear up here. But then I was talking to Jeremy and then suddenly in my, out of my peripheral, I see like a kind of a flash. And I look over and there is a ball of light, like comparatively to everything else. Like It's like the size of a penny in the sky, like a giant star. Just moving like this. And I was like, my first immediate thought was shooting star, but it was traveling like the speed of an airplane. So it wasn't like something that zipped across the sky and faded out, but it was this big thing, big white glowing orb, and it went, but then it quickly shrank. It quickly, the orb shrank to like a small size, but it didn't change speed. So it wasn't like it was fading in the distance. It just shrank its width. Well, it was hard to tell. I, I My first impression was it was penny sized and then it almost instantly, within like a second, went to like a pinpoint. <sighs> Yeah. So my impression is it could have been moving away extremely fast. But, but the it, speed looked the same. Anyway, it well, was... I mean, how do you know if it's speed or if, it, if it's shrinking or if it's moving that fast I was away? saying it went like this. Yeah, it got really small. Like pinpoint. Instantly. Anyways, I don't know what that could have been. But then the other thing... Yeah, we go back out later and then I see... And I'll well, pictures in the show notes because I got a picture of this. And I tried to take a video at first, but of course... Yeah. You know, on a phone with no long exposure for video. Uh, 
was this, it looked like a snake of lights, just slowly like a dragon of lights going through the sky. And at first I was like, Starlink maybe? Because I've seen Starlink before, yeah. but usually when I saw Starlink in Doylestown, which is, if, for those who don't know, it's Elon Musk's sort of like uh, over-encompassing Wi-Fi satellite string, right? right? It's like a string of satellites. But I've seen it before, but it was really high up and looked like a, looked like satellites. This looked low to me. And I don't know if it's because we're higher up in the mountains, but it also moved very slowly. I got some pictures of it. And then when I went around the tree to try to get more pictures of it, then we couldn't find it. Like in a moment, it was all gone. You, I didn't even move. I was just watching it. And it just really quickly disappeared. Oh, so you were still watching it. It just disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. Anyway, we'll have pictures. Anyway, that's all to say, that's what scares me in places like this is when you have the sky out there, it's what comes from the sky. The sky itself is scary. I don't forget what the term is for that fear of falling into the it. The ocean above. It is. Yeah. And the, that's what I was thinking last night, John. I was like, it reminds me of my fear of the ocean. <laughs> like, just such a massive thing. So is the sky. And there is that irrational fear that you're going to just fall into it, be pulled off yeah. uh, the earth into the, the liquid above us. Uh, but they, I don't know what that is, but there's definitely it's a real... It's called casadastrophobia um, or casadastrophobia, something like that. The fear of falling into the sky. Yeah. Yeah, it's a creepy feeling. But when you see stars like this out here, it's it's in the back of my mind. And maybe that explains some disappearances. You just get swallowed up by a sky wheel or the sky itself. All right, still in Colorado, we have this interesting account I found that I call the Diamond Eyed Drifter of Dallas. Another bizarre one-off tale I found from Albert Rosales' reports. This comes from a Timothy Good of Alien Contact. And this took place in Dallas, Texas, the night of November 17th, 1989. While relaxing in a Dallas cocktail lounge with his friend Melanie King, Bob Oshler suddenly experienced an almost indescribable sensation, similar to that reported by a witness in a previous incident in Colorado. Lasting no more than 30 seconds, the sensation began with a series of, quote, waves of energy at the back of his head simultaneously inducing a sense of acute panic. Quote, It was as if a whole range of memories, information, and emotions was being retrieved or generated at tremendous speed, Bob tried to explain. Melanie, sitting behind him, felt nothing, but realized something was wrong by the look of panic on Bob's face. He then became aware of a man standing some distance away, which he somehow felt convinced was responsible for the mental intrusion. The man appeared to be in his late 20s, was around six feet tall, with fair hair, and, quote, real clean, reddish tanned skin. Bob jumped up and pointed right at the stranger, and Melanie took off toward the entrance where the guy turned to walk out. She ran out and caught up with him. A little while later, she came back in in a stunned state. She said she caught up with the man, went past him, stopped, and looked him right in the eyes. But he didn't look at her. It was like she was not even there. He walked right past her. In fact, she doubted herself when she came back. She said that the stranger's pupils were diamond-shaped, laterally like a cat's would be vertical. These were horizontal. Later on his return to Maryland, Bob began to experience severe difficulties with his short-term memory. Well, that's weird. I've heard those kinds of accounts before. So basically, he could feel that there was something off and then they noticed this guy who was six feet tall with light hair and diamond shaped cat eyes yeah the waves at the back of his neck inducing that sense of panic mm. but yeah you hear this frequently these weird cases of humanoids these kind of impostors we've talked about before where it seems like someone has a telepathic effect in this specific case uh he felt like it was specifically that guy I mean, enough to like stand up and point at this man who then <laughs> just stands up and walks out it's a weird reaction too that she runs out to like confront him before even seeing what he looks like up close. Well, and who knows the further context of the story, because this comes from a book, I believe, called Alien Contact by Timothy Good. So this is just one aspect. Okay. What Albert Rosales does really well is he takes different reports that happen in different places and kind of puts them in a data set. Connect the dots. Right. So this is just maybe one piece of the story, but this was some sort of mental intrusion. But we've heard these cases before. So if you come across a diamond-eyed drifter in Dallas. Wait, real quick. What does this have to do with our trip? This took place in Texas. Oh, it did. <laughs> okay. Weird. I searched uh, Colorado. I wonder why that came up. Well, maybe it was meant to, maybe there's a listener out there who's met a diamond-eyed shaped tall person. 
Oh, because there was a previous incident similar to this in Colorado, so it connected. Should have read that one. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) well, that's a little special story for you Dallas folk out there down in Texas. Let's get back to Colorado. This next one I'm really excited about, just by the name. I don't know what it is, but you seem to think it's worthy. Yeah, this one is called It Came Through the Wall, and this took place in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, August 1989, at 2.30 a.m. The 11-year-old witness was laying on his bed in the basement of his grandparents' house when suddenly he woke up lying in a most peculiar position. Lying on his back with the covers pulled up to his chest and arms lying over them. He then heard his parents breathing, who were sleeping in the next room, deepen dramatically. For some reason, he began to stare at the only window in the room. Just then, an alien-type figure appeared to float through the wall and its head went through the window. After it levitated through the wall, it began floating in jerking motions towards the right-hand side of the bed. When it stopped next to the witness, uncontrolled fear enveloped him, and he attempted to scream but was unable to. Then the alien touched the middle of his forehead. It only had three fingers and a thumb. The witness felt completely paralyzed. The alien began controlling his breathing in an attempt to prevent the witness from screaming and suffocating. The humanoid was a typical gray, with smooth gray skin, huge black eyes, about four foot tall with a large head. The witness eventually calmed down and at this point the alien removed his hand from the forehead and floated back out the same way he came in. He does not remember anything else of the encounter, but feels there was some missing time involved. A week later he found a scar in the back of his leg. That's weird. We did a story. Remember the story we did where the being came over and touched the person right in the middle of the forehead? Mm-hmm. It was like a bunk. I forget what happened after that, but do you remember that? It's because it happened to you. And you lost all memory <laughs> okay. of it. It wasn't me. I don't think it was me. Weird. The weird connection there. Of course, before I heard that part, my first thought was, you know, I mean, you could jump to sleep paralysis pretty quickly just because of the typical things mentioned in there. 2.30 a.m. is a good time for that to happen. That's true. Right before the magical three. Anytime between two and three, to me, is the most dark. Once you get to four or 4.30, I feel safer. Right, yeah. Well, the <laughs> sun is on its way. God, I love sunrise and nights like that. So it's frustrating about these train schedules. So Cleveland, you leave it around three in the morning, and then our way back home, we have to leave at 3 a.m. on Salt Lake City. It's like you just, they want you to be up and around for the demons. I think it's probably better to be up than... Than to be woken up? Dead asleep, yeah. By a claw... <laughs> at 3 a.m. in at the Cleveland train depot is kind of a creepy place to be. That's true. Uh, nice attendance. Yeah, the attendance was really nice. But the atmosphere is strange. Maybe you should take some pictures and video to leave in the show notes or something. Oh, yeah, we will. We did take some footage of Bryce Canyon that I think will probably be part of the ambiance, maybe. What an incredible place that was. It's ridiculously beautiful. And uh, yeah, the legends by the Paiute people that live here. and The hoodoos. The hoodoos are like these giant towering rock formations that the Paiute story was that they were they were the evil legend people i think that this was a translation something like that and that they had done bad deeds and as punishment the great coyote spirit turned them to stone and they just look like these pillars of you know a civilization of people in these grand amphitheaters in bryce canyon it's incredible so if you guys see that on the video now that's what that is terrifying we almost died because there's no guardrail and you walk <laughs> along almost die chris is it's a an, scaredy cat you'll also you'll see the video john i'll share it with you and it'll be shared with everybody else but it's an eight thousand foot drop there's no guardrails in eight thousand feet yeah well not straight down well some spots you'd roll mm-hmm. you'd do some rolling roll to your death anyway speaking of utah that's our final stop today guys all right ladies and gentlemen boys and girls get ready hold on tight because we're at our final stop in Utah. Actually, there is no... Is there a stop in Utah? There's got to be, right? Yeah, we stopped in Moab, remember? But no, the, on the Amtrak. Uh, Glenwood. Well, the Salt Lake City. Glenwood, the hot springs. Is that Utah? That mm-hmm. was Colorado. I think it's Colorado. Anyways, you can get off at Salt Lake City and make your way down to Hatch, Utah, which is where Chris and I are currently recording. At the Cattle Ranch. So I wanted to know, you know, if this is this small town kind of out in the middle of nowhere past Punguicha or whatever it's called. Panguich, Utah. Um, there's a Paiute school nearby. Beautiful, beautiful land. But I want to know if there was any lore, and it's such a small area, I couldn't find much online. So I kept looking, and then two days before we got here, because I kept refreshing, one finally popped up on Google, 
and it had just been posted like five days ago on Reddit. That was weird timing. Reddit Paranormal that someone just experienced in Hatch, Utah, like several days before we got here. It's the only account I could find online. Bizarre timing. Yeah. That we found this. And we'll see what happens tonight. Yeah, really. See if anything similar happens to us. We have seen some things in the sky, but this account, I'm not going to say her name right now because I asked whether she wanted to be kept anonymous or not if I include the story in the show and I haven't heard back. So I don't know, but I think the story is worth telling, worth telling. And it's right where we are right now. And this just happened several days ago. So with that kind of intensity of the moment, Chris, if you're familiar with the story a little bit, would you like to read it? Sure. This happened in Hatch, Utah, several days previous to this recording. And it was posted in the paranormal subreddit on Reddit. This is kind of a lot all in one night, but this is exactly as it happened. Any insight is welcome. I don't understand how it could be connected. This past week, my friends and I rented a cabin in Hatch, Utah, at the base of some mountains. We were so high up that the house didn't have air conditioning, so we opened all the windows. This matters for later. We were surrounded by beautiful tall grass, awesome views, it was just perfect. We went out at night to stargaze, and that's when things started to get weird. My husband and I were out by ourselves after our friends went in, when we saw a ton of what we thought were satellites out of nowhere. They formed into a triangle shape, and suddenly, the night sky that was inside the triangle started to move with the lights very slowly. Almost like something was using a cloaking device to hide what it was. We both thought UFO and couldn't believe what we were seeing. As soon as it appeared, it zipped off and we didn't see anything else again, but noticed that all sound had stopped. No bugs, no bats, nothing. Except there were tons of shooting stars and a few meteors as soon as it was gone. We both went inside to tell our friends because we felt uneasy. I wish that was it, but about an hour later, we were in our room getting ready for bed when we heard a high-pitched whistle outside. We both laughed and joked about skinwalkers and wendigos. I don't really believe in that stuff, so we laughed it off and got into bed. Not ten minutes later, we heard heavy footsteps on the deck outside our room. I then jumped up and hit the lights outside on the deck and threw open the blinds, yelling, assuming it was a bear, but nothing was there. It had rained heavily that day, and there were no prints on the deck or the dirt or mud around the house. I 100% believe in aliens, but can't explain the second encounter. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? Do I need to worry about being followed? Our friends experienced none of this, and I'm just stumped. I felt so uneasy the rest of that night, but after that, nothing else happened for the next three nights we were there, and I felt totally at ease. What did I experience? So then I responded and kind of gave her my thoughts on what happened, because it sounded like she was looking for thoughts from people, and she had this response. I have found myself not wanting to talk about it. I get that the normal reaction from others is to joke, but the more I think about it, the more on edge I feel. I don't know if I'm just paranoid, but there was a big owl outside my window last night. It flew away a few seconds after I noticed it. Are owls and alien encounters really a thing? I've never given any thought to this kind of thing until now. I hear more noises at night. I feel like I'm being watched. I have lived on a 300 acre farm for years now and have never once felt anything but comfortable. But now I can't say that. It's just different now and I can't describe it. Oh, and there's a picture of the owl. We'll have that in the show notes. 300 acre. Man, that's nuts. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So to be affected that deeply that you no longer feel comfortable in your own land. Yeah. Not even in the same place now. You're, you're back home. That's, that's the uneasy, freaky part of it. It follows you. And John, there's a picture of the owl. She actually got a picture of the owl. I see it. Yeah. This will be in the show notes. Is there a connection between the owl? Yeah, there is. So, well, it's interesting. So we'll have this picture in the show notes, guys. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it now. This great shot she got at night of this owl sitting right outside her window, like literally directly in the center of the window on the fence. Almost looks like it's looking in at her. Maybe like 15, 20 feet away or something. But the connection, and that's what I told her too, my thought on that, you have the connection with screen memories and owls, right? The idea that if you're abducted or if you have some kind of contact with an entity or an alien, whatever you want to call it, that when you remember back on it, there's been cases where people see the owl. Was that communion? 
from communion uh i know the fourth kind that horror kind fourth of kind the movie yeah but it's also based on actual accounts yeah i can't remember if whitley streber had that experience but anyways people who go in regression they have these memories of these owls and the idea is that this that's the screen memory these large-eyed nocturnal things watching you and right they, either something that that your mind has put in place to protect you or, or the other theory is that it's something that whatever these entities are might be putting in place so you don't remember them right so why what i said was uh well you have this photograph of this owl which you know if it was a screen memory it's also able to affect the film the digital <laughs> right. photograph or luckily enough the owl here is an actual owl right and it's but it could still be something watching there's also a big connection between owls et experiences and synchronicity that's true just owls in general in fact i have a book on that called the messengers which we'll do at some point it's really fascinating connects all those things so there's a connection to a literal owl and extraterrestrial experiences or we had the owl man case in our own episode listener stories strange listener stories that's true the owl man in the crib yeah freaky Anyways, there's plenty more stops, but we've got to take it onto the USS expansion. USS. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, whatever it's called when you call it a train. Uh, yeah, the train engine expansion. The expansion line. We'll be sharing more encounters, more stops along the way. So make sure to sign up and uh, join us there because we are not near the end of the line. We'll be disembarking soon in the expansion. So tune in, guys. If you're not a member, sign up and we will see you on the train going back back across the states. My dearest of dear expansion members, I regret to inform you that we must postpone the thank yous for one more episode. We are sincerely sorry. It's just been difficult with the guys being on the road to uh, make this episode happen on time. So we absolutely promise, absolutely promise, we will get to everyone. Next episode for sure, there will be a lot of thank yous. And we are heading into the new studio space, so it'll be a lot easier to just stay focused and on track. So really sorry about that. I know you guys are waiting to hear your names, and we will get to them. Stay tuned. Oh, yeah. We got a studio. Oh, yes. Thank God. <laughs> yes. Yeah, finally. Thank God we have a studio. And it's awesome. It's going to be great, guys. Uh, it's perfect place. We'll be getting in there shortly, at the end of the month. We can't wait to show you. Yes. We'll be showing. Oh, yeah. More videos, more live streams. Yeah, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to get more content out to you guys and to interact. Do some more, hopefully some more live streams. It's just going to be a lot more fun for us, Mm -hmm. but it'll just be so much easier to sit down and just get in there and record instead of having to set everything up every time for five years. Yeah, right. And it's in a town, so we can walk out and get a coffee or walk out and get a cocktail. Yeah. See people. There'll be energy. And if flugel rads invade from the inner earth and it's on the news, we can probably get in and talk about it right away. That's true. Instead of being like, (laughs) oh, should we cover this? Uh, Would we make it the episode? It's got to be a week from now. Yeah. Now we can jump in and hopefully do some stuff off the cuff and live. You guys are behind... Well, that's the reason. <laughs> that's the reason. We don't have a regular studio, but we will. And it's going to be awesome. Awesome, guys. We'll look forward to that. All right, guys. And on that note, we'll see you next time on Believe Hole. Believe Hole.